Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Cato Zemo and I'm one of the second year anesthesia residents currently studying at Western University. My uh, talk today with you guys is called Airway Management for the Patient with Cervical Injury. So just an outline of the presentation, we're going to start off by talking about the anatomy of the cervical spine followed by spinal cord injuries. I'll then go through how to assess these patients and finish off with different airway management options. So going through the anatomy here, the cervical spine is composed of seven vertebrae, C1 through 7, and comprises the top portion of the spinal cord, as depicted by the blue image here. The first vertebrae, C1, is also known as the atlas. It has two lateral masses which articulate with the occipital condyles at the base of the skull at the level of the foramen magnum. The second vertebrae, C2, is also known as the axis, and it's characterized by an anterior process known as the odontoid or dens that protrudes upwards from its vertebral body into the ring of C1. The anterior surface of the dens articulates with the posterior surface of the anterior arch of C1 and it's held in place by different ligaments. This is followed by the remaining five cervical vertebrae, C3 through 7. These are anatomically similar to one another and increase in size as they descend. A series of ligaments keep these vertebrae in place and each one is separated by an intervertebral disc. The spinal cord lies within the vertebral canal and the cervical nerve roots exit in the foramina between each vertebra. There are many conditions that may lead to C-spine compromise such as spinal stenosis and in these cases there's generally time to adequately plan and optimize the situation for airway management. However, special focus during this presentation is put on trauma patients due to the nature of their injury and the urgent or emergent nature of the situation. Trauma patients should be suspected for having a C-spine injury until proven otherwise. Here I'm going to talk about important things to consider for a patient with traumatic C-spine injury. These patients may present with spinal shock. Spinal shock is a transient dysfunction of the spinal cord manifested by paralysis, hypotonia, and areflexia below the level of the injury, as opposed to a true physical derangement in the spinal cord. C-spine injuries also hold the risk of edema or bleeding and hematoma formation, which may lead to airway compromise. This may include injury to the vertebral arteries, which travel within the transverse foramen of the cervical vertebrae. C-spine injuries that cause motor dysfunction may result in impaired function of the diaphragm or other respiratory muscles, which may place the patient in respiratory compromise. And lastly, patients may present in neurogenic shock. This is classified as a loss of sympathetic tone leading to hypotension, bradycardia, and temperature dysregulation. So how do we assess these patients? For the initial assessment of a trauma patient, as per the ATLS protocol, your primary survey should include a review of the vitals. And this, again, is important to consider um, in this patient population as they may be presenting in neurogenic shock, which again is classified by hypotension, bradycardia, and temperature dysregulation. As well as part of the primary survey, we must ensure that the patient's spine is immobilized so not to cause or further exacerbate any spinal cord injuries they may have sustained. Once you have completed your primary survey, you may then proceed to your secondary survey where you'll assess for any signs of spinal cord injury. When taking a history from these patients, it's important that you determine the mechanism of their injury and the potential effects it may have on the head or C-spine. You want to ask about any neurologic symptoms the patient may have been experiencing. And you also want to know of any pre-existing conditions a patient may have that put them at further risk of spinal cord injury, such as rheumatoid arthritis, enclosing spondylosis, or Down syndrome. Moving to your physical examination, you want to start by inspecting the area, looking for any signs of injury, such as lacerations, bruising, swelling, erythema, or bone deformities. You may then palpate the spine and paraspinal muscles looking for any deformities or point tenderness. And lastly, you must complete a complete neurologic exam, testing for altered sensation and muscle weakness, and checking reflexes of the patient.
Lastly, you would obtain imaging to evaluate the C-spine if indicated, using whichever modality is required. Here I'm going to talk to you about the Canadian C-spine rule. Canadian C-spine rule is a decision-making tool used to determine when radiography should be used in patients following trauma. This is a three-step pathway as seen in the figure here. First, you check for the presence of high-risk factors. As you can see, the presence of age greater than 65 years, dangerous mechanism of injury, or paresthesias in the extremity place the patient at high risk for C-spine injury, and in that case, should get some form of radiography. If they do not have any presence of these high-risk factors, you then want to check for any low-risk factors in the patient. These low-risk factors include simple rear-end MVC, sitting position in the emergency department, whether the patient was ambulatory at any time since their injury, delayed onset of neck pain, or absence of midline C-spine tenderness. If they don't have any of these low-risk factors, then they aren't considered low-risk patients, and radiography should be obtained. However, if they do have presence of one or more of these factors, then the next step is to check whether or not the patient is able to rotate their neck actively 45 degrees to the left or right. If they can't move their neck, then they should go for radiography. However, if you have a patient that has no high-risk factors, has a presence of at least one low-risk factor, and is able to rotate their neck, then according to this algorithm, radiography is not required. I'd also like to talk to you guys about uh, Nexus, and no, this isn't referring to the Canadian and U.S. border services. COVID hasn't allowed us to travel quite yet, uh, but it actually stands for National Emergency X-ray Radiography Utilization Study, which is another decision-making tool for trauma patients with suspected C-spine injuries. As you can see here, this is much easier to use, um, and... According to this uh, criteria, you're checking to see if the patient meets all five of these low-risk uh, criteria. You want to see if the patient has no posterior midline cervical spine tenderness, no evidence of intoxication, a normal level of alertness, no focal neurologic deficit, and no painful distracting injuries. If they have all five of these conditions, then radiography is not required. However, if they don't meet criteria, then radiography should be obtained. There have been studies comparing Nexus with Canadian C-spine. There was a study by Hoffman et al. that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2000, and it found that Canadian C-spine rule was, uh, to be, uh, to, was, was to have a higher sensitivity and specificity and therefore deemed a better tool to use. So next I'm going to talk to you guys about different imaging modalities that you can use in this in these patients. So I'll go through x-ray, CTs, and MRIs. X-ray is the easiest to obtain. Um, it can easily be done in the emergency department and it's inexpensive and provides minimal radiation to the patient. Usually when x-ray images of the C-spine are obtained, uh, a lateral view is the most common, uh, but it's always uh, it's usually accompanied by an anterior posterior view of the C-spine as well as an open mouth odontoid view. Where accessible, CT is usually a preferred option uh, and is done for most major traumas, at least in big centers that uh, can get this done. Uh, CT has a high sensitivity and specificity for detecting uh, C-spine injuries, has a sensitivity and specificity both of 99%. Um, it's also indicated in patients with fractures seen on x-ray or patients with ambiguous or indeterminate findings on x-ray. However, it is important to note that it does expose a patient to more radiation, and unlike x-ray, it's usually not portable, requiring uh, you to transport the patient from the resuscitation room or eMERGE department to the uh, x-ray area or CT area. Lastly, uh, there's the option of obtaining an MRI of the C-spine, and this can be used to detect subtle fractures that aren't picked up by CT or to detect ligamentous injuries. Um, to note also, both CT and MRI may be completed with angiography to evaluate for, for any um, 
arterial injuries or venous injuries, uh, particularly vertebral artery injury. So here is an x-ray image of the cervical spine, and you can see on the left here, this is an image of a normal C-spine. This is a lateral view, and you can see in a normal patient, you want to make sure that these straight lines um, are present and there's no disruption in them. So you can see there's four depicted in the picture here. There's the anterior vertebral line depicted in orange. You have the posterior vertebral line depicted in brown. You have the spinal laminar line depicted in green. And you have the posterior spinous line dictated, depicted in red. And what you want to see is that the vertebrae in the C-spine all line up in these lines. And disruption in this will uh, be indicative of a displacement or a fracture. So you can see on the right here, this is a patient that sustained a C-spine injury. And if you follow this posterior line, you can see that there is um, a break in the line indicating a uh, fracture around C6, C7. You can also see along the front here, indicated by the small arrows, there is some uh, bulging of the soft tissue, which... Uh, is indicating swelling in the area. So how do we manage the airway of patients with a C-spine injury? Um, looking historically, once upon a time, surgical cricothyrotomy was advocated for by ATLS guidelines in these patients to minimize cervical spine displacement. Um, however, that was not very well studied or evidence-based and wasn't always done uh, for reasons I think we can understand. And then came a period of time where nasal intubation became the method of choice for these patients. Uh, today, most providers opt to using either a glidoscope or an awake fiber optic. Um, however, direct laryngoscopy is still an option uh, to be used. Airway management may be required uh, both in the emergent situation for an unstable patient that's presenting to a hospital or may be done electively in a planned general anesthetic and the management may differ in each of those cases. I'm going to talk about the concept of uh, manual inline stabilization and then I'll go through the advantages and disadvantages of each of these techniques listed here. So manual inline stabilization uh, is a maneuver that applies uh, force to the head and neck to offset any applied forces to the spine that occur during airway management. And the goal is to keep the head and neck in the same position throughout the intubation process. As you can see in the picture here, stabilization is performed by an assistant which in my experience or at my center has usually been a surgical colleague either from the neurosurgery team or ortho team. Um, and it's important to note also that if a, uh, a cervical collar is applied to the patient, that it should be removed during the intubation and manual uh, inline stabilization by an assistant is, is used in its place. Um, you can see in the uh, picture here one proposed way of doing it. So the assistant, which is here on the left, um, is... Uh, is coming across the front of the patient's body and is using their hands and forearms to stabilize the head and neck in relation to the torso. Another uh, method of doing it is having an assistant beside the intubator um, with their hands on the patient's mastoid process or uh, cradling, cradling the occiput, making sure that the head doesn't uh, move throughout the intubation process. Um, if you look at older publications, there's some reference to applying traction during C-spine uh, precaution. However, this uh, is now thought to compromise the spine, especially in the presence of ligamentous injuries. And therefore, current recommendations only advocate for inline immobilization. However, I think one thing that's important to note is that when uh, keeping manual inline stabilization, which is helping protect uh, to further um, exacerbate an existing C-spine injury or, or uh, possibly uh, cause injury, uh, a primary, uh, a secondary injury to the patient, um, that inline, manual inline stabilization uh, can impair the intubator's view of the cords and make tracheal intubation more difficult. Um, last thing to note is once the airway is secured, the if a cervical collar was placed 
before, it should be uh, reapplied back onto the patient unless they're going to be going for imminent surgery uh, of their C-spine. So the first uh, technique I'm going to go through is direct laryngoscopy. Direct laryngoscopy is a fast, uh, easy, and simple uh, method to use. It uh, has the advantage of being easily accessible in peripheral hospitals or out of or out of hospital situations, and it therefore makes it a great tool for emergency situations. However, some of the downsides with direct laryngoscopy is that it's more prone to C-spine movements when compared to the glidoscope or the awake fiber optic scope. Um, in cadaveric studies, when they looked at the C-spine motion that occurred uh, with, uh, with patients with unstable C1, C2, um, oral intubation caused a 1.6 millimeter reduction in the spinal cord space. However, it was unclear how clinically significant this uh, may be for the patient. Another study uh, was looking at um, the motion of the C-spine during direct laryngoscopy, and it found that the majority of C-spine motion occurs at the craniocervical junction, and it therefore made the conclusion that higher C-spine fractures are mo at more risk uh, for further compromise using uh, direct laryngoscopy. It's important to note that, uh, as we said before, using direct laryngoscopy uh, may uh, it, it may be difficult obtaining a uh, proper view of the cords um, if you have a patient with features of a difficult airway, uh, as well if you're trying to maintain inline stabilization. However, in emergency situations, uh, the use of direct laryngoscopy with a bougie um, is thought to be a great method for quickly and reliably capturing the airway uh, with experienced providers, um, meanwhile minimizing any force on the C-spine. So with the direct laryngoscopy, um, the goal is to bring your anatomic structures in line so that you have direct visualization of the cords. Um, however, with intubating techniques that avoid having to bring these structures in line for direct visualization, you have the potential advantage um, in an immobilized patient. And so given the nature of video laryngoscopy, it requires less force for laryngoscopic view and endotracheal tube placement, making it a favorable option. Some limitations in its use uh, include uh, the fact that it may be inaccessible in emergency situations or uh, in out-of-hospital uh, out uh, situations, and it also requires a, a level of provider experience. Um, as well, another limitation in the video laryngoscope is that any blood or secretions in the airway may obscure the, cam the, uh, the camera view of the cords and may uh, make intubation difficult or impossible. However, uh, despite this, uh, there was a study by Mosier et al. Uh, published uh, in the Journal of Emergency Medicine in 2012 that suggested uh, that there's actually better first attempt success rates when using video laryngoscopy uh, versus direct laryngoscopy. And lastly, there's the awake fiber optic intubation. And as with video laryngoscopy, this technique allows for minimal to no C-spine movement uh, to secure the airway. And it's an excellent tool in elective and semi-urgent situations where C-spine immobility is the goal. And um, in actually serving uh, anesthetists, uh, most anesthetists stated that it was the preferred method for C-spine injured patients. Um, another advantage that uh, the awake fiber optic uh, intubation has is that it actually allows for neurologic examination of the patient before uh, and after intubation in surgical positioning. So uh, once they're intubated, you can get feedback to see if there was any further compromise in their neurologic uh, status, um, and you can do the same after you've positioned the patient. Um, however, there are certain limitations, again, with this technique as well. Um, same as that we saw with video laryngoscopy, it can be difficult to use in emergency situations. Um, and also, if there's blood or secretions in the airway, uh, it can lead to obstruction, uh, obstructing the view of the camera. Um, as well, even more so than the video laryngoscope, 
uh, a weak fiber optic intubation requires a uh, in, uh, operator experience, um, someone who's comfortable and competent in, in using this technique. And it also requires a cooperative patient. Ultimately, when it comes to uh, which technique to use, uh, the final decision re relies on the both the provider's experience and their clinical judgment uh, based on their patient assessment. The last thing I wanted to touch upon, I just wanted to go through a couple things to consider in this patient population, uh, patients with C-spine injuries that require intubation. Um, so they're generally trauma patients, and trauma patients may have concurrent injuries of vital organs that may need simultaneous attention uh, during or and or after securement of the airway. And also in, in trauma patients, they're presumed to be full stomach, so there's the risk of aspiration, and that needs to be weighed uh, against the time it may take to secure the airway. Uh, another thing to consider, succinylcholine shouldn't be used or sorry, should be used with caution uh, in patients with potential spinal cord injuries unless it's been uh, uh, less than 24 to 48 hours. Um, it is believed that after the 48-hour mark, succinylcholine uh, carries a risk of hyperkalemia due to extrajunctional receptors, and this can lead to hyperkalemic arrest. And lastly, if a patient does have a C-spine collar on or they're intended to go for uh, surgery on their C-spine, this may make uh, central access through the jugular uh, vein more challenging and uh, alternative uh, access may be required. These are a list of my references. And I want to thank you guys for listening. I'm Cato, and I hope to see you guys next time.